verse says that God who is rich in mercy for his great love with which he loved us. And the way the verses are split up, it sort of dangles there with a comma. The main thoughts before verse 4 are that the odds are impossible. The conditions, the situation is hopeless. But God, and this is about God doing something wonderful to redeem the whole situation and hopefully to redeem us. And the Bible says, but God, who is rich in mercy, we have preached about mercy, the mercy of God. And then this morning, as we did the last week, we looked at a section here at the end of the verse. It says that the mercy comes about because of his, his love, his great love with which he loved us. And last week, we looked at John chapter 3, verse 16. Did you know the biggest selling Christian book right now is uh, 316, based upon John 316, Max Lucado. And this is the verse. I'm sure it's some of the sporting events of this week, and football especially, maybe. Uh, but behind the, the catcher, behind the umpire, we'll see somebody slip up 316. They're behind the fans, uh, behind the, the, in front of the camera somehow, from the outfield. And some representation to try to get people to think about or recall what they've ever heard about 316, which is, of course, John 316. And we noted last week in John 3.16 that God loves. Note a distinctiveness about his love is that it's not just the kind of love that we have, but it says he's so loved with such an extent of love, with such a quality of love, that he was able to accomplish the great things the verse goes on to speak of. So the verse says, for God so loved the world. Then we stress how the world there is not the um, kind of globe or the the kind of thing that you used to have on the stand that you tilt around and you put your finger down and you see where it landed. No, not a globe world, but a world. The word really has to do with people. The, the, the thing that God loves about this church is its people. Not so much this building. This, the building is not the key to, to God and to his love, his provision. What is key is his love for the people of Woodside Baptist. And the Bible says, John 3.16, that God has this kind of love for the whole world of people. It is the people of his creation that he loves the most of all. And what did he do? The Bible says he gave. And we've noticed before that love usually uh, degenerates into somehow giving or expression somehow. I'm not joking about degenerates. Of course it is. Those things are a product of love. And God could not help it why he, loving us, gave. And so the Bible says he gave. And it speaks about his only begotten son, which probably means so many things, but one of the things it means for sure is his only or his unique son. And certainly the son of God and the Trinity is unique. But we're speaking here of the Messiah, the one who came, and at behest of the Father, came and gave himself for us, John 3, 16, that whosoever, it says here, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Isn't that a wonderful thought? To not perish, not be reincarnated, no, not to disintegrate. You know, it's God in charge, and he's in charge of this body, our soul, our spirit. So that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, it says. Perishing. That is not our end. That is not our lot. But it says here instead have everlasting life. Have you shared that joy with someone lately? It is indeed a great joy to think, hey, when you think of loved ones passing on, it's a wonderful thing to think that there's a heaven. It's a wonderful thing to think of how we'll all be together, those who love the Lord, someday in heaven. And John 3.16 is one of the verses that has to do with this. But I've observed, maybe you know this too, that a lot of people take this for granted. Do you take the love of God for granted? And I'm assured that we do, all of us. Why is it that we usually are exhibitors of hardly any passion towards our Lord? Obedience does not come easy. We find it hard to really feel flush with the joy that should be ours and of God who has had mercy on us. A mercy that was generated
motivated by his love, but we seem largely unmoved. Pastor Rose would like to see more response generated by way of obedience. We struggle with sin, don't we? One of the things about God's mercy and goodness, why it should result in the holier lives. I'm glad we sang, holy, holy, holy. I'm glad because we need a reminder a Christian is one who owes his soul to God by the blood of Jesus Christ and should have a desire to live a little bit differently than those outside of Christ and a holy life separated unto him. Oh, what a great verse is John 3, 16. But what, what, what are we about? Usually, we are careless. What does careless mean? The word careless means that, in essence, we could care less. It's shown not by our declaration, but it's often shown by our priorities, the things we find joy in, the choices we make. Do we have a relationship with God? May I suggest to you that even pastors struggle with their relationship with God, for sure. I look at my day, and over many years I have records of this. My three busiest days of the week, think of your own, but my three busiest days of the week are Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and that order. Believe it or not, the busiest day is Saturday to get ready for Sunday, which is a self busy day. And Monday, a day off, seems so busy sometimes it's hard to believe. But I struggle, maybe you do, in finding time to be alone with the Lord. To spend some time with Him. The hardest day of all those three, of all seven days, for me is Sunday morning. Because there's so many things to get ready for this service or this day. And so for me to get a chance to grab a few minutes to even open the Bible for non-sermon reasons and to spend a little time in prayer very hard on a Sunday morning. But then I wonder, well, if I love the Lord, why don't I have a passion to make sure I, I, I have a time, even Sunday, when it's hard? You know, <clears throat> I've sometimes wondered about where is our passion? We think of this great love for God that we should have and how far short we fall and how indeed many times it is though we have no passion for Him, we take Him for granted. Are you one who takes God for granted this morning? We take things for granted sometimes. I put it in the title of the sermon this morning. I think of the word entitlement. We think certain things are going to come our way and sometimes we interpret the scripture so that that's reassuring I can put off response, for instance, to the offer from God of hope and salvation through Christ, because someday it'll come around again, and I'll grab that ticket then. I'll get aboard then. It'll all be right then, but right now I'm not ready. We think it's ours and assured, uh, but it's not. Please know this. God loves, and he loves the world, and again, that includes us. But there's an end to that. A great uh, speaker for the Lord uh, who died probably about 10 years ago of cancer was Curtis Hudson, who pastored a great church in Georgia and became the editor of the Sword of the Lord magazine, a rather conservative evangelistic magazine, pretty good in many, many ways. And he was a great man. And one of the things that uh, he was gifted at was uh, succinct little sayings that have bite or insight. And one of the things that Curtis Hudson said about love and hell was, he said, you can well go to eternity unsaved, but you'll never go to eternity unloved. And the Bible says that God loves us. It is the motivation from God as to our salvation for Christ on the cross you and I, who are not at all worthy, they, like many other things, we feel entitled, though. We feel entitled that this is ours by right. No, the truth is, we don't deserve this hope. We don't deserve it at all. And maybe that could be a little bit of the reason for our carelessness in our daily walk with the Lord. Because if, first of all, we know what horrible sin He's delivered us from, and then we realize how blessed and wonderful he is and that he gave himself up and 
and was killed for our sins and transgressions, and it was because of our sins that he died, why we're going to value this Savior, this God, a little bit more and be less careless. But we have this habit. We think it's our due. You know, in my generation, I look back at my grandparents and my parents. Uh, each of those generations owned their own homes. My mom was a single mom, uh, owned her own home. Uh, how she did that? She worked like a mad woman. She struggled and uh, sacrificed. It was barely possible, just barely possible. Succeeding generations, maybe even this generation, we think of our parents, our grandparents, and we think, they had houses or homes of their own. Will I have that chance? Will I always be a renter, let's say, or somehow less stable because I don't have my own home? And it's the American dream, isn't it? Isn't, isn't it true that every one of us is entitled to, to that kind of life and that home? And we have a dream and we think, it's our due, it's our due. Is it? Is it our doom? I think about the health controversy going on right now, the health reform situation. There are certainly some things that need to be reformed by way of the health system. But think of all the alternatives we have today, all sorts of testing and drugs. I think in my own life, I had a grandfather that died of heart condition in his early 60s, but I think of my advantage Maybe I'll get another couple of years because of all the different kind of medicines that are available today that he did not have. I think, oh, hey, hey, what about this test? And you're considering it too, aren't you? What about this on my health? And what about how far should I go to get myself in health again? Or how long do I want to live? Uh, do you ever observe that or feel that with a little bit of guilt and think to yourself, I'm a Christian. Why am I so interested in staying here that much longer? There's a heaven ahead! There's a heaven ahead! And indeed there is. But somehow we've got this idea, this more political, it's ingrained in us, that we're entitled. 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 Our entitlement really has this thought that, that to many things that are really privileges, we consider to be our right. I have the right to this! I have the right to that! Listen, if you make a mistake of saying that that's what your relationship with God is about and that you are due anything from God, what can be done to humble you to the proper level you truly are? For the Word would tell us that this great God has humbled Himself to reach down to us. We are unworthy ones. We'll see that in this morning's scripture, but know this. Yes, He's a God of love, Ephesians 2 verse 4. But don't you take that love for granted. Our God is not some inflate, in, in, uh, ego-inflated uh, grandfather, doddering, pliable, you know, trying to please the grandkids kind of relation. He's not some grand bellhop. Don't abuse his love. Don't abuse his offer of love. And because this seems to be our tendency, we're careless in our relationship, and it's no wonder that our salvation is taken so lightly. Please know that when we hold ourselves as being due these blessings from God, we misunderstand what the Bible says. We understand, misunderstand what the Bible says uh, <clears throat> about, about grace and our hope and our salvation. This morning, brought a book. This is a book uh, in the scramble to throw out, to grab a few personal things at the time of my grandparents leaving their house many years ago. I ended up with a, a short pile of books that were my grandfather's. Uh, his name was Jesse James Spargo, his last name was Spargo. He definitely lived after the time of Jesse James the Outlaw, a famous American uh, folk history, a real person. But whether he was named after him, we don't know. Uh, uh, he was an orphan, my grandfather. How he became a Christian, I'm not sure. But in the 20s and 30s, my grandfather and my grandmother, they were co-pastors almost in essence, in the Salvation Army right here in the city. And uh, humble work, I'm sure. When I was born, and I knew them, it was in the 50s. 
And they lived in a small town upstate in New York across from a little Methodist church. And my grandfather lived the rest of his years really as a custodian in a, in a public school and then retired from that. And he left a, a few books. And here's a book I've been reading recently. It suggests something of one or two things powerful for this morning. And I won't, won't read from this book, but I've been using it for my devotions lately. And I'm, I'm tearing it apart. Uh, I don't want to be, but I am. It's called How to Be a Transformed Person, E. Stanley Jones. Um, he suggests in one devotion that someone who, personally, I have always thought, oh, he certainly became a Christian, might not have been a Christian. And then he suggests another person like that, too, as sort of a parallel case. Who is he talking about? Well, last week we preached on John 3, 6, 2, didn't we? That's in a portion where Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. And Nicodemus appears again just very quickly in chapter 7 of John. And then near the end of John, he, with Joseph of Arimathea, remember that? With Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus goes to, the, to get the body of the Savior and to bury him finally in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Strange suggestion from E. Stanley Jones. Nicodemus ever saved. Now, most of what we do know about Nicodemus from those three mentions that all in Scripture are all uh, sort of uh, inconsequential, without decisiveness, we can't tell for sure. Joseph of Arimathea is even worse. They did something. Uh, Nicodemus, of course, first came early, apparently, in the ministry of the Savior and confronted him. He was coming sincerely, it appears. But E. Stanley Jones suggests, look at these two men. They were almost Christians, Jones believes, but never made the grave. Jesus, seeing Nicodemus' divided soul, said straight off that he needed a new birth. Nicodemus didn't understand then what he meant. After the interview, Nicodemus sinks back it appears in the history and into the herd and the generality of the Jews of that day in Jerusalem. And uh, we really don't hear much about it until chapter 7. A little bit later in chapter 20, near the end, certainly.